Yeah. Okay. This hearing of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee will come to order. Two years ago, as the people of Cuba took to the streets chanting down with a dictatorship, government forces tried to silence the protesters with tear gas and violence. Afterwards, a Catholic priest from Cuba visited me and told me about a young man who came to see him in church. He related the story saying, quoting the young man, I would fight, the young man said. I would give my life for the cause of freedom if only someone would know that I died. If only someone would know that I died. I think about that two years later, as I look around the world at those people willing to risk their lives to defend democracy and human rights. From the activists facing execution in Burma, to those being jailed by dictatorships in Belarus or Venezuela, to those bravely protesting for their fundamental freedoms across Iran. And I think about what we can do to support these people who are alive and fighting, so they will not want to die just to be remembered. The international community, in my view, is not doing enough. The United States is not doing enough. And Congress is not doing enough. We're trying, but we need to do much better. So I hope to hear from all of our witnesses today about what more we must do to support human rights and democracy. How can democratic nations like our own better respond to autocrats like Putin and Xi, who have been meeting and marshalling their forces across the globe? Do we have the right tools to hold them accountable for their blatant atrocities of the rules-based international order, to combat their aggressive disinformation campaigns inside their own countries and around the world, and to counter their economic warfare and diplomatic bullying, whose impact can be seen when we look at how many countries were unwilling to censor Putin for his war in Ukraine? For too long, authoritarianism has lured world leaders with the promise of personal wealth and perpetual power. Authoritarian regimes have also been investing in technologies to control and repress their citizens, leading to social credit systems and intrusive state surveillance. We need to adapt our assistance to keep up with emerging technologies that can support democracy activists and human rights defenders to keep the, the internet on when dictators try to turn it off, to shield the identity of those trying to report the truth. At the same time, we must also confront and understand the causes of the way of coup attempts that have increasingly undermined governments across the globe. From Burkina Faso in Tunisia to Peru and Brazil, we cannot st stand idly by as democratically elected leaders are threatened or pushed out of power by mobs or militias. Because despite all of these challenges, pro-democracy movements are fighting back in some of the world's most repressive environments. And fragile democracies continue to push forward with democratic reforms. I'm pleased that this week, the Biden administration is convening the second summit for democracy with events in Washington, Zambia, the Netherlands, and South Korea. But I'm not sure I totally understand what the results of the first one are. We have to strengthen our efforts to help nations deliver for their people who want nothing more than peace and prosperity. That's why I'll be introducing two important pieces of legislation. First, the Protect Global Heroes Act, which will create a new limited visa category for human rights defenders and democracy activists facing imminent danger and persecution. And second, a comprehensive countering authoritarianism bill to strengthen the US response and the tools to combat autocratic regimes. Beyond such legislation, the United States must better leverage our democracy assistance, international diplomacy, and sanctions regimes. We must keep pushing for the release of Chinese political prisoners, like Ihan Toi Toti, the Uyghur writer, or Luis Manuel Otero in Cuba, or Vladimir Karamusa in Russia. Their struggle against tyranny is also our struggle. It is in the national interest of the United States to support the people and organizations fighting for freedom. Respecting human rights delivers the stability and fairness that makes investment, capital growth, and innovation possible. Democracies bring more wealth to more people and are more stable 
than autocracies. Democracy is more than just an ideal. It is a governing system through which people can hold their leaders to account and advance human rights. Democracy is a practical engine of self-correction and improvement that empowers people to constantly, peacefully struggle towards a better life. It's that better life that we want to help make a reality. With that, let me turn to the ranking member for his Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, the United States has uh, been the largest and uh, most robust supporter of democracy and human rights around the world. Unfortunately, in spite of our significant investments and efforts, freedom and democracy are constantly under attack. According to Freedom House 2023 Freedom of the World Report, it is the 17th consecutive year of decline in freedom across the globe. We have all plainly seen authoritarians across the world increase their attacks on internationally recognized human rights. In every region, totalitarian and authoritarian nations like China, Russia, Cuba, and Iran are implementing new tools to silence a civil society. Putin's war in Ukraine is the most blatant attack on democracy we have seen since the Cold War. The United States, alongside our European allies, uh, have been on the front, forefront of supporting Ukraine in this battle for freedom. But Ukraine isn't the Kremlin's only target. Inside Russia, uh, the Russian people have had their political and civil rights stripped. Any form of dissent is punished. The most prominent opposition uh, leaders are jailed on fabricated charges and given harsh sentences. Russia's authoritarian influence has stretched to Belarus as well. Uh, we're honored today to have uh, uh, Svetlana with us, and uh, she's going to testify uh, here today. As the president-elect of Belarus, she was forced to flee after dictator Lukashenko stole another election. There are an estimated 1,000 463 political prisoners inside Belarus. I look forward to hearing from your experience how the U.S. can better support freedom fighters such as yourself. The next battleground for freedom and democracy will be Taiwan. China has made clear its willingness to take Taiwan by force. The U.S. and the rest of the world must not stand idly by. We know exactly what the Chinese Communist Party would do to destroy rule of law and human rights because they just did it in Hong Kong. Uh, they were testing the West to see how we would respond. Now, the Chinese Communist Party continues its subjugation of this once vibrant city, including the persecution of Jimmy uh, Lai. Uh, we strongly condemn this, and Mr. Lai should be released immediately. Beijing should know the world has not forgotten about him or the Hong Kong people. The Biden administration must not allow Taiwan to become the next Afghanistan, as we learn the hard way there. When the U.S. retreats, the rest of the world suffers. We have seen the human rights of women and girls completely obliterated by the Taliban in very short order. It is important to remember that democracy is more than just about holding elections. We are seeing play out in Nigeria. Uh, in a healthy democracy, elections must be free, fair, and transparent. Now I ask today's witnesses, what can the U.S. do better to support democracy and human rights around the world? As the Biden administration holds its second summit uh, for democracy this week, I hope to see less talk and more action. I agree with the chairman in that regard. This is the second one. We didn't see much come out of the first one, but uh, again, uh, sometimes these things do take time to blossom. But they should concentrate on actually getting something done. The speeches are wonderful. It is one thing to gather countries together for a conference, but we need to do more than just pay lip service to democracy and human rights. Democracy can only endure when they have institutions that are strong and can sustain them. Uh, condemnation of human rights violations in the speeches are all well and good, but what we really need is action. I look forward to hearing from the witnesses on what U.S. tools have worked to support democracy and human rights and where we can improve. The dictators and authoritarians keep inventing new ways to suppress. We need to get creative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Resch. Uh, let me introduce our witnesses. We're deeply honored to welcome Leopoldo Lopez, a Venezuelan pro-democracy activist, public servant, opposition party leader. Mr. Lopez served two terms as mayor of the city of Cacao before founding the political party Voluntad Popular in 2009. 
In retaliation for his efforts to speak out against the brutal Maduro regime, he spent more than three years under horrendous conditions in a military prison, subjected to torture, solitary confinement, and years more under house arrest before seeking refuge in Spain. Mr. Lopez has received widespread international recognition for his work fighting for democracy and freedom in Venezuela. He is a co-founder of the World Liberty Congress, a new initiative gathering pro-democracy activists and political actors to share ideas on how to combat autocratic regimes. So we welcome you and thank you for traveling here to join us with us today. Uh, we're also honored to welcome Svetlana Tianoskaya, uh, the leader of Belarus's democratic opposition. After the regime jailed her husband, Sergei, <clears throat> who was running against the ruthless dictator Alexander Lukashenko in the 2020, election, uh, 2020 elections, Ms. Tikhanoshkaya violently stood for election in his place. The Lukashenko regime prevented free and fair elections in Belarus. However, Svetlana is widely believed to have won the most votes. Since then, she was forced out of Belarus but has admirably represented her country across the transatlantic community, fighting to keep the pressure on the regime in Minsk and serving as a voice for those resisting its brutal repression. We warmly welcome you as we build support for the Belarusian people's democratic aspirations in the face of Europe's so-called last dictator. Thank you as well for traveling and joining us today. Finally, we welcome Mr. Damon Wilson, the President and CEO of the National Endowment for Democracy, where he leads the organization's mission to develop and strengthen democratic institutions around the world. Mr. Wilson has demonstrated his deep commitment to supporting freedom and democracy around the world throughout his storied career, which includes work at the State Department, NATO, the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, and the National Security Council. We're honored to have you here with us today, and again, we thank you for your time. Uh, we'll start off uh, the witness's testimony. Your full statements will be included in the record without objection. We'd ask you to try to summarize in five minutes or so so that we can have a conversation with you after your testimony. And we'll start off with Mr. Lopez. Thank you very much, Chairman Menendez, uh, Ranking Member Rich. It's a very honor for me to be here talking about something dear to our heart and to our destiny, which is the fate of democracy in Venezuela and in the world. As you said, I was sent to military prison in 2014 after calling for protests against the autocratic regime of Nicolás Maduro. Spent almost four years in solitary confinement, sentenced to 14 years in prison, and then sent to house arrest from where I escaped in 2019, and spent the next year and a half at the Spanish embassy, and at the end of 2020, I was able to escape from Venezuela against my will because I never wanted to leave my home country. And now I've been living in exile. As Senator Rich was saying, democracy is in decline. 17 years, consecutive decline according to Freedom House. According to VDEM, 70% of the world's population is living under some sort of autocratic regime. However, global polling also shows that 80% of the world's population want to be free. And we have seen that in the protest in China, Iran, and Cuba. Surprising protests, but are an element that gives us hope that people want to be free. I have most often asked, why is Maduro still in power? And this is a question many people ask me. And there are many ways to answer this question. Some people would say it's because of the military that support him. Others would say that it's because of the natural resources. Others would even say that it's because of the opposition not being united. However, I believe that the real reason, the main reason why Maduro is still in power is because of the international support that he has from the adversaries of the United States, from Russia, from China, from Iran, from Belarus, from Cuba, and from other autocratic regimes. And Maduro, very clearly, is part of an autocratic network, what Anna Applebaum has described as Autocracy Inc., an autocratic network that is aligned in protecting themselves, defending themselves diplomatically, creating a kleptocratic network, and pushing forward their view that autocracy should be the world model for governance. And its main enemy, very clearly, is liberal democracy. And its main enemy within, within that is very clearly the United States that has been promoting liberal democracy worldwide. Being in exile gave me the opportunity to meet hundreds of other political activists, democracy defenders like Stevlana and many others that have gone through what I went through. 
exiled political prisoners and now living in an autocratic regime. We have worked to come together uh, through an initiative that it's called the World Liberty Congress, as Senator Menendez just mentioned. The World Liberty Congress is an initiative to bring together like-minded activist movements that are willing to go forward and support the process to bring about democracy in our country. Alongside with Gary Kasparov from Russia, with Masih Alinejad from Iran, we convened more than 180 activists and leaders and met in Lithuania at the end of last year and created an action-oriented way forward to support these pro-democracy movements. It's not an easy task, but the most important task that we have is to recognize that we are not alone. We spent the first day in Lithuania hearing more than 40 delegations, and we heard, to our surprise, the same story, told in different ways, from different perspectives, from different voices, but it was the same story of harassment, political prisoners, people going into exile, crushing the hopes of the people to be free. And it is from this perspective that today I ask you so, uh, following uh, proposals. First is the decisive support to democracy movements. Democracy movements today require the support of the United States and beyond. Democracy movements today are facing a paradigm shift. In the 1990s, the idea was that democracy was going to happen everywhere in the world. It was going to knock the door. But now we know that democracy needs to be fought for. And we need the support for these freedom society movements that are all over the world. Second, we need to visibilize the, the reality of political prisoners and transnational repression. Visibilize and also increase the costs for the regime of having political prisoners. Third, there needs to be massive access to free and uncensored internet. We believe that to combat misinformation and to give the people the possibility to communicate and mobilize, it's critical that access to internet is widespread accessible to the people under autocratic regimes. This will also give the people within autocratic countries to have access to new tools to get resources inside their countries using financial technology. Fourth, sanctions need to be rethought. Sanctions are not a silver bullet. Sanctions are a means to an end, but sanctions are a tool that needs to be used because they can be an effective way to pressure the regimes. Fifth, we believe that the private sector needs to be included in this conversation. In the same way that ESG concept has brought trillions of dollars to investment in the environment, we believe that to these three letters, ESG, there needs to be an additional letter, F, for freedom, to channel investment for the private sector to initiatives that will help people to be free in different areas. Fifth, to incorporate, to avoid giving legitimacy to autocrats. We have seen, sadly seen, that sometimes in the United States and in other countries, there is some sort of recognition to autocrats, and we believe that this gives them stability and a way to continue to go forward. And finally, the U.S. needs to lead from the front. There is no way that the struggle for democracy and freedom will be won if the United States doesn't lead this struggle and support the transition to democracies elsewhere. We need bipartisan support, as we have seen today, but this bipartisan support also needs the incorporation of all of the branches of government and include the alliance, effective alliance, with other free countries in order to fight the fight for freedom, which is something that autocrats are very clearly doing with their own interests and with their own view that autocracy should prevail. Democracy, to prevail, needs the support of all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Tekunoshkaya. Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Rich, distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you on behalf of millions of Belarusians struggling for their freedom and independence. I want to tell you about the dire state of democracy and human rights in Belarus and how it impacts on regional security and global interests. I will provide brief remarks. My full testimony is submitted for the public record. In 2020, Belarusians voted to remove the dictator Lukashenko, who had been in power for 26 years. Initially, I hadn't planned to enter politics. I was just wanted to support my husband, Sergei, who had been arrested after announcing his run for the presidency. 
and so I participated in the presidential elections as the united opposition candidate. And the regime did register me as a candidate as a sort of joke. No one will vote for a woman, they thought, but they were mistaken. According to independent polls and observers, I did win. Voting for me, Belarusians voted for change, for democracy, and for the future of our country in Europe. But Lukashenko refused to step down. Hundreds of thousands took to the streets in peaceful protest to defend their vote and their future. The regime responded with violent crackdown on the innocent citizens. Brutal state repression targeted all groups, women and men, children and seniors, activists and journalists, doctors and athletes, human rights defenders and entrepreneurs. Tens of thousands were arbitrarily detained. In KGB jails, they were tortured, humiliated, raped, and even beaten to death. Recently, the United Nations admitted that the repressions in Belarus have all the signs of crimes against humanity. More than 4,000 were imprisoned on trumped-up political grounds. Prison stems are extremely long. My husband, Sergei Tikhanovsky, received 19 and a half years. My own sentence is 15 years. Political prisoners have become symbols of courage and dignity. Igor and Daria Losik, Maria Kolesnikova, Pavel Sivirinets, Mikhail Statkevich, even Nobel Peace Prize laureate Alis Bilyatsky, just to name a few. But thousands more remain invisible and receive very little support. Despite the fear and terror, Belarusians haven't stopped fighting for a single day. People joined the nonviolent underground resistance, conducted acts of disobedience and sabotage. With the start of the Russian war against Ukraine, our resistance intensified. More than 86% of Belarusians are against Belarus engagement in Putin's war. Our goal is to liberate Belarus from tyranny and preserve its independence. There is no doubt that an independent, sovereign, democratic Belarus is in the interest of the entire international community. However, Putin's Russia doesn't see Belarus as an independent country, but as a vassal state. With the help of Lukashenko, Russia expanded its military presence and is taking over economic and financial controls. To please Moscow, Lukashenko destroys Belarusian national identity, the core of the nation's soul and resistance. The Russian military is freely using Belarus ter territory, making our country a co-aggressor in the war against Ukraine. Finally, Putin just announced that Russia is deploying tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus by July 1st this year. Some call it occupation some creeping annexation. Putin wants Belarus as a consolation prize in case he loses the war in Ukraine, and we must not let it happen. Russian troops must be withdrawn from Belarus territory, and Belarus should stop its participation in this unjust war. I believe that democratic changes in Belarus would shorten the path to Ukraine's inevitable victory. So I urge the United States, to appoint a special envoy on Belarus to oversee the growing Belarus agenda, to take strong measures on releasing political prisoners and ending the terror unleashed against Belarusians. It can be done through strong targeted sanctions in coordination with the EU, UK, and Canada. To increase assistance for Belarus' democratic movement, civil society, media, human rights defenders, and all the repressed to initiate international proceedings against Lukashenko's regime for crimes against humanity, for crime of aggression, and for complicity in war crimes in Ukraine. To continue supporting Ukraine in its brave fight for the right to be themselves and decide their own future. I urge the U.S. Congress to update the Belarus Democracy Act to reflect the role of Lukashenko in the war and suggest policies for the U.S. government. I welcome the initiative of strategic dialogue with Belarusian democratic forces and call to introduce this mechanism by other friends of Belarus. In conclusion, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the United States, its people, and government 
for the decades of principled and strong support for a democratic, sovereign, and independent Belarus. We share the same values and aspirations, and we must continue to fight for freedom together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Wilson. Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Risch, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss how the environment in which we work has fundamentally changed, how NED is adapting, and what more our nation could do. The endowment was created 40 years ago with bipartisan congressional backing as an independent foundation dedicated to strengthening democratic institutions and values around the world. At the time, fewer than 60 countries were considered free. Soviet-backed communism seemed stable behind the Iron Curtain as Moscow-fueled conflicts around the world. Today, while the world is far more democratic, authoritarianism is again on offense, led by Beijing and Moscow. Last week, as Xi Jinping was departing Moscow, he said to Vladimir Putin, now there are changes that haven't happened in 100 years. When we are together, we drive these changes. I agree, Putin said. These changes they are referring to are meant to make the world safe for autocracy, which by definition means a threat to democracy. This underscores the biggest shift our nation must make in its support for democracy and human rights around the world. We must recognize that our work and that of democracy advocates on the ground is taking place in a more hostile environment. Autocracies are waging a sophisticated, coordinated, global campaign to undermine freedom. They're increasingly using technology, financial networks, and manipulated media environments together, not only to better control their own people, but also to bolster each other, capture elites, and undermine democratic practices and rule of law. As such, democracy advocates must work in common cause in support of liberty and freedom. It's an extraordinary honor to be testifying alongside Svetlana Sikhanovskaya and Leopoldo Lopez to heroes of democracy. Indeed, democratic leaders would be in power today in Minsk and Caracas if not for the backing that Alexander Lukashenko and Nicolas Maduro have received from the likes of Putin, Xi, and diaz Canel. Svetlana and Leopoldo have told you that they are not fighting a fair fight. This new environment means that we must learn, adapt, and raise our game by helping our partners on the front line do the same. And thanks to Congress, that is what Ned is doing. The endowment now provides $300 million in grants to more than 1,500 civil society and media organizations in over 100 countries. This includes support for our four core institutes, which draw upon the expertise of both major US political parties, as well as the business and labor communities. We are singularly focused on our mission of supporting the courageous people on the front lines of freedom in the most challenging and dangerous places. At NED, we don't presume to tell our partners what they should do. We support their democratic ideas. We stand by them in their nonviolent struggle. NED's approach is built on people, on long-term relationships of trust. Our unique structure allows us to respond quickly, as when Afghans fled the Taliban's takeover, Iranians or Cubans suddenly mobilized in protest, or Nicaraguans were expelled from their homeland. We're increasingly using resources to enable our partners to work together and to learn from each other, to fight malign information operations, to protect media integrity, tackle kleptocracy, and foster democratic unity to counter authoritarian influence. We've stepped up our investment in innovation to ensure democratic activists have access to the latest tools to work more safely and effectively. And we're supporting efforts by civic actors to gain a seat at the table around the digital and technological norms shaping the future. This committee has asked what the United States can do better to support democracy and human rights around the world. To defeat this network of autocrats, democracies must unite around a co focused counter-mobilization across multiple sectors. Our nation should put democracy at the center of US foreign policy by treating democracy as strategy, not programs. This means recognizing that the advance of democracy is among the most cost-effective national security strategies. We should ensure foreign assistance bolsters democracy. Most aid does not support democracy directly. However, it should support efforts to demonstrate that democracies deliver for their citizens. We must enlist other democracies to commit new resources 
to support freedom and human rights around the world, including creating NED-like organizations. We must also adapt our, instance, our own institutions to ensure that they remain nimble. When a coup or invasion occurs, rigid project management is the wrong approach. Our learning curve needs to outpace the learning curve for dictators. Finally, we must keep those on the front lines of this struggle in the lead. Democratic change is more successful and sustainable when it is anchored in local circumstances. We should be proud of our efforts, confident in our values, but humble in our approach. We must begin by also keeping Ukraine and Taiwan's ability to safeguard their democracies front and centered, and we should remain optimistic. The record numbers of those fighting repression and fleeing authoritarian regimes provide proof that people everywhere understand what the research shows. People are happier, healthier, safer, and wealthier living in a free society. History tells us the most repressive and seemingly secure regimes can crumble, brought down by ordinary people demanding freedom. And it's our honor to ensure that those working for justice, dignity, and freedom know that we have their backs. Thank you. Ranking Member Risch. Uh, well, thank you very much. I, I'd like each of uh, the three of you to uh, respond, if you would, to the specific question I asked in my opening statement, and that is, well, look, we, we've all given long speeches here today about the problem. We know what the problem is. We know what uh, uh, the difficulties are, the challenges are, and, and we all want to do something. And uh, the question I have for each of you is, is uh, what is that what? What is it that is specific? There's been a reference made uh, uh, to some of the things that, uh, that we've done, uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, financial uh, uh, pressure is something that, that's important, but those are, those are hard to do and even harder to enforce. So um, maybe each of you could give me a, a short statement of what, what you think uh, the, the specifics are. Starting with you, Mr. Lopez. Thank you, Senator Rich. I believe that the most important aspect is to have a paradigm shift in terms of what type of support is needed. For a long time, most of the support has been focused on development issues and thinking that strengthening civil society is the way to go for the moment when democracy knocks the door to our countries. But now we know that that is not going to happen without a struggle, without a fight without the support for those people who are willing to put their lives, their freedom, at risk. And this is what I call the concept of freedom society. We need to identify the movements, the people, the individuals, the activists that are willing to stand up against the regime. It's critical to have internal pressure. Democracy transition requires the pressure from the inside. People want to be free, but people require the support from countries like the United States. And this is support that can be translated in different types of um, aspects that are critical. Of course, resources, capacity to communicate. And I mentioned one that I believe is critical to every single country that is under an autocratic regime, free and uncensored access to internet. This is something that can be a real game changer. We are today in, in, a, in, a, in countries that are under autocratic regimes that are completely closed. People don't have information. They don't have the capacity to effectively communicate. And having free access to uncensored internet and to affordable smartphones can be a real game changer. And I know that this requires some technological improvements. But in the same way that the world came together to find the vaccine for COVID-19, I believe that the world and the free world needs to come together to provide free access to internet. This will give the possibility to communicate, to mobilize, and to effectively have a strong position against the autocrats. The second is, no, there's, there's... I, I believe that uh, sanctions uh, should be rethought, and they are strategic. There is often a discussion around sanctions that if they should be imposed or not imposed. I don't think that this is black or white. This is sanctions or no sanctions. This is about effective sanctions, and particularly, and I can tell that in the case of Venezuela, it's not only to sanction those government officials or the officials of the dictatorships. It's also to identify the enablers, the individuals, the companies, within and without the autocratic countries that are creating this criminal structure 
of kleptocratic regimes to give uh, the, the standing to these regimes. So these are some concrete ideas that I think need to be thought of. I appreciate and that. Svetlana, could you give us a couple of words? Thank you. Uh, I might reiterate all the uh, Mr. Lopez said, but as for uh, Belarus uh, in particular, I want you to initiate the International Tribunal against Lukashenko and his cronies for he doesn't feel impunity for his crimes against Belarusian people and his crimes of uh, aggression. We are asking to increase uh, sanctions on uh, Belarusian regime to punish uh, them also close loopholes because uh, uh, usually regime, regimes do, do have opportunity to use other countries to circumvent sanctions and it gives them opportunity to uh, survive. We are asking to in, uh, create coalition of uh, countries for independent uh, Belarus to keep uh, our crisis high uh, in agenda. Uh, we are asking to initiate the discussion on Belarus in international organizations. We ask to organize hearing on Belarus in G7, UN Security Council, uh, also including the discussion uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, block the regime from uh, taking the seat in the UN Security Council. As I said, send special envoy to Belarus to uh, have constant communication with the government of the USA. Also declare that all the agreements uh, that uh, Lukashenko made since 2020 are illegal, that uh, they, will not be, they will never be recognized uh, by democratic countries, and also speak out in uh, support of Belarusian independence. Now, when our sovereignty is under threat, we see the signs of creeping occupation. It's very important that uh, powerful countries are defending uh, our independence, our serenity, and uh, people will feel this. And of course, be vocal about Belarus, because people in our country who are fighting, they need to feel that they are not abandoned, they are not forgotten, and that the world with uh, them. It gives us inspiration to continue our fight. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I have a, sp a specific question for you. Had your election uh, actually come to fruition, uh, we know you won, but uh, that doesn't do any good unless you actually take office. We also know that in these uh, countries that uh, repression is only uh, uh, successful because the military, the police, and the security forces obey the uh, orders uh, of the head of, the st of state. What, what's your thought about what would have happened had you uh, taken the presidency? Would, would you have been able to take command of the military and the security forces? One of our main tasks is to split elites and split the uh, military environment of uh, Lukashenko. But it might happen only when those people inside the regime see that Lukashenko is not recognized. He is losing legitimacy. He is uh, uh, unshakable in the normal democratic world that there is no future with him. So uh, in that case, you know, they will, at a particular moment of our history, they will take the side of people. And we already see this signs. You know that Lukashenko launched a new law that uh, allows him to bring uh, people from nomenclatura and from uh, military uh, service to death penalty if they are accused of uh, uh, state treason. So he's afraid of internal coup d'etat or internal betrayal, and we have to split, you know, these people even more. Sure. Well, and that's, obviously, that's a key. If uh, you can peel off major uh, uh, people in the security forces and or the military, that, that changes the dynamics because obviously they have the command of the power and uh, uh, that, that's where it's at. That, that's uh, how, uh, how they keep order. So uh, be interesting to, um, uh, to see uh, by looking at the personalities involved there, which ones are the, are the most likely to flip because that's what's gonna change it. There's no question about it. Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Senator. I would outline a couple of key points and where we could do better. And the first begins with that paradigm shift of understanding democracy is strategy. It is the most effective return on investment for our national security in a world in which autocracies are on, on, on offense attacking democracy. Um, second, leaning in on innovation. This is where understanding to how to leverage technology for democracy the investments, modest investments we've made in circumvention tools to see a skyrocketing use of VPNs to gain access to the internet, mirror sites to uh, uh, overcome 
firewall blockages, investments in the new t next generation of technology, as well as tools like uh, financial forensic skills to track kleptocratic stealing of, of wealth. Um, third, really adapting, adapting some of our tools. As I said, sometimes our institutions are trapped in project management, and when things change, there's a coup, there's an invasion, we don't need to be strapped by contracts on a project. We need to be focused on how to actually be there with folks in the fight and support them in real time and have that flexibility. Sir Menendez mentioned his efforts behind the Global Heroes Act. This has been a big challenge we've seen increasingly with rising numbers of democracy advocates forced from their countries, pushed into exile. Many countries don't have the capability to support them with visas and able to get them set up. And I think a rapid response among democracies coherently is quite important. And I would also say aligning other foreign aid, economic support funds with the US Development Finance Corporation, MCC. A lot of AID projects are not per se about democracy, but in this world they should be aligned such that they are helping support transitional democracies to deliver for their citizens in this contest. And finally, I would say it's important that we enlist others. Many of our allies, democratic allies, Japan, South Korea, Australia, are generous with development assistance. We need them to be equally generous with democracy assistance. And I think that's somewhere where we can help enlist other partners in this cause, all the while understanding that we have to keep those in the fight and the lead, and to recognize it's their agency, their struggle, and we are only behind to support them. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks uh, to all of you for being here. I want to talk a little bit more about press freedom, and I'm going to ask you uh, each the, the same question. Uh, well, actually, I'm going to ask a, a slightly different question for Mr. Wilson. What's working on press freedom? Because we're obviously seeing the trajectory is bad, but I'm, I'm wondering if there are kernels of hope and what we ought to be investing in, thinking about, talking about as quickly as possible, because I also want to cover Internet freedom. Go ahead. I'd say a couple of things. What we've seen is a consolidation and autocratic control often of mainstream media outlets, consolidation around TV stations, print newspapers, where we've seen a burgeoning of creativity, innovation, and ideas is on online digital platforms, YouTube channels, and the growth in the audiences of these has been quite remarkable and also sustained in a way in which independent journalism is thriving. We see this both in autocratic societies and in semi-open uh, societies. And so it is not all bleak. There's a lot of opportunity there. Second, investing in those new technologies to reach audiences where they are. The use of telegram, telegram channels, YouTube channels, and other means, oftentimes arts outreach, to reach mass audiences with democratic messages and broader audiences when traditional TVs are not, uh, uh, not available. Miss, um, Miss, uh... Hold on, I'm going to get it. Good luck. Tika Nuskaya? Did I get that roughly close? Oh, good. Um, so here's my question for you. It seems to me, I have two questions, right? One on press freedom and one, one on internet freedom. And it seems to me they are increasingly becoming the same question. I'd like you to speak to press freedom and internet freedom. And if in practice, this is becoming the same question. So in uh, Belarus, there is no uh, uh, media freedom. You know that since 2020, all the alternative media in our country have been liquidated. Uh, journalists uh, were arrested. Uh, tens of them now are behind the bars. But uh, Belarusians have to be inventive, have to, have to be creative in these obstacles, and the leadership of media uh, uh, had to flee Belarus and reinstall the media outlets in exile. And now, uh, we are using all the possible uh, platforms like uh, YouTube, uh, Instagram, controversial TikTok, you know, to deliver our messages to Belarusian people. And moreover, in Belarus, all, all the media, alternative media, are declared as extremists and people who are subscribed or follow um, uh, tweets or whatever, they can be uh, sentenced to years and years in jail for this. But people know how to uh, use VPN. People are being uh, educated, you know, and uh, uh, we are trying to uh, deliver the truth to Belarusians on the ground and to the world. Of course, it's difficult to counter to uh, Russian and Belarusian uh, propagandistic narratives because they use all the possible uh, state um, uh, outlets, uh, TV, you know, to uh, show the views of, of uh, regimes. And uh, that's why we are asking uh, our allies, uh, independent countries, to assist more 
to our media to open bills and services in uh, international um, uh, media organizations like Voice of America, for example, just the world to hear the voice of free uh, Belarusians. Thank you. Mr. Lopez. As it's been said before, uh, the regular media in Venezuela and in many autocratic regimes is completely closed. TV stations, radio stations. Just recently, Maduro closed 80 radio stations in Venezuela. So thinking that converting regular media as a way to communicate with the Venezuelan people uh, is it's something that it doesn't seem that is going to happen. Social media through access to internet can also be an alternative. However, we need to understand that social media today has been contaminated by the influence particularly of Russia. In the case of Venezuela, we have seen how the Russian influence in the communications of social media in Venezuela, it's happening through bots, through trolls, and that conversation has also been impacting the perception of the Venezuelan people. So it's critical that we understand that the social media conversation requires some participation and support from, the, uh, from this uh, uh, technological organizations to th uh, really combat the trolls, the bots, the influence, the external influence of, uh, of, of Russia and, and others. And I give you an example. In 2014, when we called for protest, I was completely banned from regular media. I could not go to um, TV stations or radio stations. And we called for protest only through Twitter. Only through Twitter we were able to get hundreds of thousands of people to the streets. But today, 10 years after, that reality has completely changed. The conversation in social media is manipulated, contaminated, and Russia plays a big role in the way in which this is happening. So free access to internet is critical. Thank you very much. Let me thank Senator Schatz for presiding while uh, we have an important banking meeting. We have a few problems in our banking system. So, uh, so let me uh, uh, follow up. Uh, I listened intently to your testimony, and I got a summary of uh, some of the responses you have given while I was away. I'd like to get, a, a, if, if I can, a little more granular, uh, because we're really trying to think about how do we support those of you who are on the front lines in a meaningful way? And, and I've heard, for example, uh, you know, um, uh, Mr. Lopez, you said support, uh, you know, the, 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 a the activists for freedom, not just civil society. In what ways? Because sometimes we hear, oh, if we support A, B, or C in the country, it's going to be the United States that is trying to create a subversive, uh, you know, uh, response or a, a overthrow of whatever that existing tyrannical government is. And so there's that question that's always raised, well, we shouldn't do that too much. <laughs> On the question of the Internet, of course, uh, part of our challenge is that for the Internet to be free and open, uh, you still have to be able to receive it on the ground in the country that you're in. We, we have this problem with Cuba, uh, where we'd like to have, uh, I've been advocating for a free internet and thinking about satellite transmissions and other ways, of course, circumvention technologies that we use, but that then gets into the question of, can you just beam into a country uh, where there are other international conventions that suggest you can, and can you get the receptions on the ground? So just by way of example, when you say support those who are fighting for freedom, give me a tangible, what would you, if there was an A, B, or C, is that about uh, economic resources? Is that about uh, greater access to our surrogate broadcast. If you can help me, I'd appreciate it. Well, research shows that supporting um, <clears throat> civil resistance and nonviolent movements has been proved effective. And what this means is supporting the possibility to provide training, massive training, simultaneous training to activists under autocratic regimes. And training um, in civil resistance methods, in nonviolent methods, in communications, in movement building, giving the capacity, the confidence to activists on the ground that they are not alone, that they can have the capacity to organize and to extend that organization. 
In two weeks, we will launch what we have called the Global Freedom Academy from the World Liberty Congress. This will take place in Zambia. We will start with the training of the first cohort of African activists that will be trained in these issues. We have taken the best practices from all of the research and, um, and the information of what works in terms of providing strength to movement building. And we have a moonshot idea to train in person one million people in the next three years in countries that are autocratic. And this will give confidence and the capacity to mobilize. And I can tell you firsthand that this works. We have done this in Venezuela. We have created networks of uh, activists, men and women, that are committed for the struggle for freedom. And this is why uh, there is a difference between the development type of support that Mr. Wilson was talking about to the freedom type of support that we are talking about. This needs to be decisive, and there needs to be no fear in supporting the movements and the people who are willing to put their lives at risk to provide change. We will be always uh, confronted with the accusations of regimes. They will accuse any activist of being a spy of the US, of being a terrorist, of being influenced by the United States or the organizations of the United States. I remember one day, Damon Wilson asked me, are you afraid that you will be uh, signaled as being supportive of the United States or being part of this network? And I said, they are always going to say that. They always say that, whether you receive the support or not. So it's critical that that support is received. Let me ask you about this. You, you mentioned that in your opening statement that sanctions need to be rethought. In what way? Because sanctions is one of the few peaceful diplomacy tools we have to get a country to rethink how it's acting or to try to move it in a different direction. How, when you say to be rethought, what are you thinking about? Well, we just we have seen recently in Venezuela a massive uh, scandal of corruption, and it's very clear now to the Venezuelan people and beyond that the problem in Venezuela is not sanctions. We have heard over and over that the crisis, the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela, is a consequence of sanctions, and this is simply not true. In the year 2019, before the sanctions were imposed, the Venezuelan economy had collapsed by more than 60 percent. More than four million Venezuelans had fled the country at that time. So it was not because of sanctions. It was because of mismanagement and corruption. And today, we believe that sanctions should be focused not only on government officials, because the government uh, structure is only a facade to the real political economy, to the real power structure in our country. So when we are talking about sanctions, we are thinking of targeting the enablers, the individuals, the companies that are behind this kleptocratic network of corruption that is providing support to the dictatorship. And we also think that there needs to be some multilateral thinking of how to apply sanctions, because Maduro is linked with Lukashenko, is linked with Putin, is linked with the mullahs from Iran. So there is a transnational kleptocratic network that also needs to be targeted um, in an effective way. So that's what we are thinking in terms of re reproposing sanctions. Thank you. It's very insightful. I have other questions for, for our panelists, but let me turn to Senator Shaheen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to each of you for being here. Uh, special thanks to Svetlana Tikhanovskaya and Mr. Lopez for the sacrifices that you and your families have made to promote democracy and human rights. And Damon, thank you for your work as well. Um, we had a press conference last week with uh, Ms. Tikhanovskaya, and one of the things we talked about was the number of Belarusians who have been imprisoned. Um, here I have a picture of Ihor Losik, <clears throat> excuse me, who is a journalist who's been in prison now for th over a thousand days, who reports were that he tried to commit suicide um, last week. If we were going to make a poster for everyone who's been wrongly imprisoned in Belarus, we would not have enough room in this room, much less in the building. Um, I'm sure the same is true in Venezuela. One of, one of the issues that we had talked about was um, trying to encourage the State Department to appoint another special envoy for Belarus. So, can you discuss why that would be important for the opposition movement in Belarus, um, Svetlana? 
Thank you, Senator Shaheen, for this picture and that you are advocating for the Belarusian prisoners whose number is increasing every day. Every day in Belarus, about 17 people are being detained every day. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, designating special envoy to uh, Belarusian Democratic Forces it has extremely important meaning. We had very fruitful um, collaboration with uh, uh, Julia Fischer. She opened us a lot of doors, created a lot of opportunities for us here in the USA. She delivered our messages. She uh, connected us with the uh, necessary people here in um, in the U.S. government. And uh, when she left, we just physically felt this lack of attention, lack of communication, lack of collaboration. And if there is a person who is like a bridge that is connecting countries uh, is uh, uh, designated, it will be much more easier for uh, Belarusian voice to be heard here in this world, to be heard in uh, the government, because we know that uh, this attention uh, pen is rather short and we have to be always on agenda that Belarus is not overlooked in this situation, that Belarus is not left for one day later. So to update information about what's going on in our country. And this way, we will um, uh, hope for uh, concrete, for decisive actions from uh, the USA. But because when this connection lost, so uh, we are not uh, in focus and uh, we can easily be uh, like forgotten. Well, you'll be pleased to hear that Secretary Blinken last week in his hearing said that he's hoping to have a special envoy appointed very soon. So we will continue to raise that issue. Um, can you talk about what the reaction of the people of Belarus has been to Putin's announcement that he was planning to move nuclear weapons into the country? And what, what as the opposition, you think um, the United States and other countries should do to try and discourage that? So people in Belarus understand that uh uh, this possible deployment is against Belarusian people's will and against uh, our constitution. That uh, Russia now uh, acts as an occupying force. It uh, violates uh, our national security and makes Belarus possible uh, target. And by deploying uh, nuclear weapons, uh, Russia is trying to subjugate Belarus and deprive it uh, of uh, sovereignty. And uh, uh, I think that international community must demand uh, from Russia to stop deployment of uh, nuclear weapons and impose strong sanctions on those who are responsible for this. And of course, launch a uh, hearing in the UN Security Council about uh, this case and uh, to show uh, uh, regime of Lukashenko and uh, Kremlin strong reaction on this. Because the feeling of uh, impunity is very strong now in uh, uh, pro-regimes uh, countries, and uh, uh, we have to understand that uh, dictators cannot be appeased, cannot be re-educated, and uh, they understand only their language of power, and democracy has to show its teeth. Thank you. Um, Damon, I only have a, a little bit of time left, but I wanted to ask you about Georgia, because um, I was there the end of February. I spoke with Ken Wallach before he was headed there, and one of the things we talked about is the fact that the, the people of Georgia are still very interested in um, joining the EU and looking west, um, and yet the government of Georgia seems to um, be behind the people in supporting those efforts. What more can we do to support the people of Georgia? <coughs> Thank you for raising Georgia, Senator Shaheen. Uh, we were quite concerned in the past uh, 10 days when the government tried to introduce a, a law that would restrict foreign funding to NGOs, essentially copycat laws that we've seen proliferate across the world, um, this one mirroring quite a bit of what was done in Russia. Uh, in response to that, you saw the Georgian people turn out in incredible numbers on the streets of Tbilisi. We sent our chairman, Ken Wallach, to Georgia on a mission to, to raise our concerns with the government and to bolster support our partners. And we've seen the government step back from the brink at this moment. 
I think that the real issue here is understanding, as you said, the Georgian people see themselves in Europe and have made that clear repeatedly. And so our bet, our commitment, our stand needs to remain with the Georgian people across the country, including outside of Tbilisi, that organized from farmer agricultural unions to teacher groups, a much broader cross-section of society was mobilized and protecting what they understood was a beginning backsliding, a hit at their democracy. Uh, so I think investing in the people, maintaining pressure on the government not to do these types of things, and I think really keeping a focus on how to support the enabling environment and those actors to ensure a free, credible, fair election as they look towards that next year, and ultimately to have the Georgian people decide that trajectory in their future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, let me just return to a couple of final questions. Ms. Tishkinovskaya, uh, you have a unique insight uh, in the global fight for freedom. Uh, the wife of a political prisoner, the candidate uh, that uh, won the election uh, as a woman. Um, do you think that there are any unique insights that you face versus some others, Mr. Lopez faces or some others face uh, in that fight for freedom as a woman in that fight? No, I think that uh, women sometimes are, you know, tend to be even stronger than men. And, uh, you know, when obstacles uh, put you in such situation when you have to show your strength, when you have to trans transfer your anger to strength or love to strength, you just do this because you know that you are doing this for uh, your children, for the future of uh, uh, your country. You just like uh, behave as, as, as mother for all. You, you feel in pain of everybody who is in jail, of everybody who has to flee uh, the country, but you realize that you are not alone, that you have strong uh, Belarusians, uh, people who really want to help you in the world and you understand that uh, you like take uh, strength from them as well. And you uh, are on powerful only then when you have people around you. And so as I'm still here, there, I still have this power. So I know that uh, hundreds of thousands of people around the world are supporting me, supporting our movement and supporting free and democratic Belarus. Thank you. It's um, a very great insightful answer. I'm reminded all the time by my daughter, my wife, and others that they are stronger. So uh, let me, uh, and, and members of this, and members of this committee as well. So uh, <laughs> let me, uh, let me um, ask you what I asked Mr. Lopez. You specifically said in your opening statement, increase assistance to the democratic movement. In what way, specifically, would you want to see that? Well, I believe, uh, no, I'm we, sorry, Leopoldo. I, I, I'm asking Ms. Tishinovskaya. Uh, you, you answered that for me largely. I want to hear from her perspective. You said increase assistance to the democratic movement um, uh, in, uh, in Belarus. W w tell me what you would want to see us do or others in the world do in doing so. You know that... Uh it's impossible to fight inside uh, of Belarus at the moment. We have underground movement, underground resistance, anti-war movement in our country. But most of our NGOs have been ruined inside Belarus and they have to, had to relocate outside. And all those initiatives, organizations, they need assistance to continue the fight. And we don't have opportunity to get this assistance only from powerful countries, powerful foundations. And we are asking our, you know, those, those people who believe believe uh, in the changes in Belarus, who believe in Belarusian people, to support our human rights defending centers who are supporting political prisoners and their families, for them not to lose hope, to support our media to uh, deliver uh, honest news to Belarusian people, to support our cultural initiatives because we understand how strengthening of national identity is important for Belarus uh, because for last 20 years, 
seven years, you know, Russia was um, uh, russified, you know, uh, everything possible in our country, and we have to keep our national identity strong. We are asking to support our sportsman initiative, because uh, our sportsmen uh, went against Lukashenko's regime back in 2020, and they are suffering uh, because of this also a lot. We ask not to invite uh, a pro-regime sportsmen to uh, different sports events, but instead invite uh, uh, free sportsmen. Uh, also, just and when our people see that you are not, that they are not abandoned, that uh, they uh, receive this uh, opportunity to continue the fight, to, to build ties, to uh, create this, to, uh, that you are institutionalizing our relationship, they have power to continue. We are not asking to fight instead of us but help us not to be exhausted, not to be overstressed, you know, with this, uh, this difficult fight. We will do uh, everything by ourselves on the ground, but help us, you know, to, to sustain, not just to sustain, but to win. Thank you. Mr. Wilson, um, uh, our USAID administrator, uh, Samantha Power, recently wrote that, quote, advocates of democracy have focused too narrowly on defending rights and freedoms, neglecting, among other things, economic hardship and inequality. Do you, uh, well, I don't want to say do you agree because you know, you're a grantee, so uh, I don't want to put you in a conflict, but give me a sense of that. Uh, you know, it struck me, and of course, you know, economic hardship and inequality, if we deal with those core issues, sometimes that, that gives us a strengthening of democracy and less likely for autocrats to be able to take hold. But by the same token, if, if our democracy assistance efforts is uh, about sending economic assistance to bright spot countries uh, where peaceful pro-democracy movements have been successful, yet democracy remains fragile, which I think is a worthy cause, but I'm not sure that that now becomes the, the focus of our assistance. So how do I help uh, these two distinguished people uh, create movements uh, and that are successful in their countries if I'm focused on the bright spots uh, alone. Can, can you give me a sense of that? Senator, yes. Um, I'd sort of frame it a little bit differently because you're exactly right. If you're talking about Belarus, Venezuela, Russia, China, we need to stand by those who are in freedom society, those who are fighting for political freedoms, human rights, dignity, individual liberties, in a very, very hostile environment. What I welcome from so, the USAID administrator's point of view is that a large part of foreign assistance in the United States, but especially in our democratic allies, is development focused. And I think what she's arguing is aligning that development focus behind our democracy objectives so that Ned is not going to get for, involved, for example, in energy projects or infrastructure. But AID's funds that do that should be focused in a way that they are supporting democratic leaders, those on a transition path, to help them show that their citizens can deliver. That alignment, I think, is really important across the foreign assistance approach because that's not always the case, and it's particularly not the case with some of our partners. It is not a substitute for the direct democracy programs that are absolutely required in the toughest places. That's an area where the endowment specializes. And you said um, you cautioned against the allegations that we'd be seen as the instruments of the U.S. For us, it's very clear. For us, we stand behind their ideas. It's their struggle, their ideas, what they, can they do. And by our getting involved in a way how do we make them more effective and hopefully more secure through digital security and physical security? And so I think there's a different way to think about it. We have to stay focused on democracy assistance in the toughest, toughest places, and that's not development aid. Um, that's where we need to actually be able to think more like venture capital for democracy, be able to take risk, invest in some new technologies that lead to more secure VPNs where we've seen skyrocketing access in Russia or creative investments in satellite television that have provided Afghans a new audience, whereas we've seen the effectiveness of a digital wailing wall for COVID in China breaching the Great Firewall. That, that sort of venture capital approach. Also, we've talked a lot about media. 
Sometimes our development assistance is restricted to capacity building training. And oftentimes these are quite sophisticated media outlets. They don't need more trainings. They actually need support with operations, content production, uh, facilities, and, and content. And I think some of those restrictions, that's where flexibility comes into play. Finally, as Senator Shaheen talked about Ihor, who was arrested, who tried um, Commits, was working, uh, uh, almost committed suicide while he was in captivity. Coming to this project, come, these approach with flexibility, we had a partner arrested in Belarus last week. Many traditional donor agencies would have to stop their grant to that organization because he's been arrested. We don't. We work with the organization to pivot, to change the objectives, to ensure that that organization can survive, the family is supported, that it's focused on political prisoner advocacy, rather than just saying, oh, that project no longer applies. And that mentality bringing into all of our instruments of flexibility, being relevant to the circumstances in which we're in, I think is helpful. Well, I appreciate if our development assistance is going to have a democracy bent to it, uh, that's great. But of course, USAID is very often the entity that uses direct democracy grants. And so uh, I'm, I'm concerned about uh, making sure that we don't um, uh, turn away from helping uh, uh, courageous people like those who are with you on the panel uh, and, and think that let's go just consolidate that which we have. And I don't want to use the word forsake, but uh, triage away from that. that. That's a dangerous proposition. Uh, I don't know if that's what the administrator meant. I, I intend to have conversations with her uh, about that, but it, it's a concern to me. Um, well, thank you all for your insights. I, I mean, uh, I normally don't do this, but we have a vote going on the floor, but there, is there anything you have not said that you want to say uh, before I close this hearing, Mr. Lopez? I would just like to support what you said at the beginning of the Democracy Heroes Act. And I can tell you that this is something that is very important for, I would say, hundreds or maybe thousands of people who are in exile that don't have uh, a stable migration status. And that takes them to a position where they are uncomfortable, they are in a fragile position to continue their work from exile. So I commend and I think that this is something very important for the struggle of those of us who are in exile. We need to continue to bridge those who are in exile, like us, with those who are in the inside. And the Democracy Heroes Act, in the way you present it today, I think is uh, an important way forward. Thank you, thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Tishka. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to say a couple of words of gratitude to senators who are involved into a uh, group for Democratic Belarus here in the uh, Belarus and Caucus who are keeping Belarus high uh, on agenda and help us to fight with uh, dictatorship and Russia. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I would just footstomp your last point that Ned's forte is the toughest cases. If you look at our top 10 portfolio, China, Russia, Cuba, Venezuela, uh, Belarus, Burma, North Korea, Afghanistan, Ukraine, Sudan. We are in the toughest places uniquely in a way because we don't have to have a cooperative grant agreement with a government, because we don't have field offices and presence. We can stand by those that are on the front lines of the fight for freedom in the most difficult places and understanding that their success, when the opportunity opens and they're in a position to succeed, that will have the greatest impact in mitigating the threats to US national security. And so seeing the support, democracy support, in the most hostile environments is fundamental to an investment in our own security. And that's why we're proud to stand by the cause and the movement of people like Leopoldo and Svetlana. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Richard. This has been very helpful. We hope we can continue to uh, count on you uh, as we develop a continuing agenda to uh, maximize our ability to deliver on behalf of freedom fighters and the democracy movement in the world for insights. Uh, with the thanks of this committee, the record for this hearing will remain open until the close of business on Wednesday, March the 29th. Please ensure that questions for the record are submitted no later than tomorrow, and this hearing is adjourned.